Hello and welcome. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. It's the season of Easter. And I want to reflect on what Easter means, partly because I was interviewed by a news programme yesterday on Easter Sunday and halfway through the questions they said, would you like to give an Easter message to our viewers? It came without any warning at all. So I did my best and I talked about the way in which life is fragile and complex and deals with polarities, life and death, light and darkness, truth and untruth, forgiveness and revenge, and Christ offers us a way to all the things that are good for us and are most true and wonderful because he rose from the dead, because he's who he said he was. These things are profoundly true, but I wanted to expand on them a little because this Easter 2024, we're in a very unusual place. Even last year, and certainly not the year before, I don't think I could have foretold the context of what it means to celebrate faith in the living Christ in the way in which we're having to do it, surrounded by two particular forms of darkness that are coming upon us. And I don't mean to be over-apocalyptic. I think being apocalyptic is not a sign on the whole of mental health. But there are two signs of darkness, and I want to mention them. They're both competitors to Christianity. They're both ruthless, and they're both determined to suppress it and wipe it out. And they are, of course, on one side, the religion of peace, and on the other, uh, this great utopian crusade from the left, to use a Christian word, of cultural Marxism or a form of progressive secularism. Both of them literally hate Christianity. Both of them hate Christ. And so there are ways of trying to find models of interpreting what's going on. They can be political, psychological, historical. But I think one of the things we want to be able to do is to, to do is to use spiritual pneumatic. And I think we have to say to those of us who see the world in terms of a conflict between good and evil, we are dealing with with perverted, distorted, dark, evil ideologies that are essentially spirits. This is a spiritual conflict. St Paul tells us that we must, by all means, use our intellectual and physical muscle, but actually we have to use <clears throat> the muscle of the spirit too to understand what's going on. And it is quite incredible to me the way in which these two competitors are closing in on the faith in the West. And there's a great danger, I think, in the next few years of a complete collapse of Christianity, partly because no one's fighting back, partly because many people in the middle of all this who have inherited a Christian culture, have inherited the, the the benefits of the sanctity of life that Christianity brings, of freedom of speech, of a sense of the human rights that derive from lives being gifted and protected by God. All the benefits, they don't understand the connection, the umbilical cord with Jesus, and so they're allowing them to be swept away, and they have no way, they don't know any way in which to fight back. We have to fight back in order to tell people the truth. One of the things I want to do, apart from reflecting on on the evidence for the resurrection very briefly, is to think of what Jesus meant when he said he was the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. That would, if I was using a text, be the text. But today let's just think about the evidence for the resurrection. I think the evidence goes back to Jesus himself. Once Jesus appears in the Gospels on the historical scene, you've got to do something with him. He's too big, too important, too powerful. He has too much of a purchase on the human imagination. There is a kind of space within us that Jesus fills. And it's almost impossible to, once you've met him, to, to, to get rid of him. You have to somehow find an argument for saying he's mispresented. But even... Even if he's mispresented by the gospel writers, where did they find the genius to invent such a man from? That doesn't work as an argument. How could somebody who said the things he said, as Lewis says with his, his uh, three-layered proof, where he was either a madman, a liar, or the son of God, how could he say the things and then fail? How can he say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life? No man comes to the Father but by me, and then fail completely. Who would say that? What kind of megalomaniac 
How could he talk about providing forgiveness for sins when no man can do any such thing? And how was he able to raise people from the dead? They were a canny society. They were quite as intelligent as we are and uh, quite as gifted as, as we are though before the scientific revolution, quite as politically sophisticated as we are. And yet in the face of public scrutiny, Jesus lived out three years healing, delivering people from evil and teaching people in a way that ultimately provoked his cancellation because he set himself up as a competitor to the two major forces of his day, the Roman Empire on the one side and the Jewish establishment on the other, and neither were prepared to give way to him, so they had to kill him. In a way, the same thing is true today. We have these two forces on either side. We have the religion of peace and we have progressive utopianism, cultural Marxism. Neither are prepared to give way to Jesus because Jesus exposes them both as subhuman, ultimately false, as, as inadequate for the human condition. Irenaeus of Lyon said that the glory of God is a man fully alive. He didn't mean us in our existential flowering, as it's often taken to be. He meant Jesus. He described Jesus as, as the melody of the music that God has created. The glory of God is Jesus fully alive, Jesus resurrected. It is impossible that the disciples could have behaved the way they did unless they had been overwhelmed by an encounter with Christ after death. People don't behave like that. It's, it's hard enough to love him and be faithful, even in the conviction that he is who he is. But to have seen everything go down the tubes in failure and to see him being wiped out by state execution, there's no way back from that. They made too many mistakes before that. They got frightened too early. They made too many misjudgments before the crucifixion for them to suddenly come right afterwards in an extraordinary way that built the Catholic Church from the roots of the apostles themselves. It's just not, there has to be another reason for it and the reason is the resurrection. There is the shroud, of course. Increasingly, the shroud uh, has, as one looks at it, is the most extraordinary artifact because this image is provided by something like nuclear radiation, something like the most enormous power burst that left a negative on a negative image of, of, of this corpse on the shroud. We can't fake it now. It could never have been faked then. To look at the shroud, to see what it is and to ask how it came to be is again to be presented with with a solution of which the least difficult is simply that this is Jesus and he rose from the dead. But let's think about the way he described himself as an antidote to these two dark forces that are closing us down because they're both, they're both forces of control. They want to circumscribe human behaviour and they want to cancel Jesus because he's too much of a threat. He says that he is the truth and they are not. The, the phrase, I am the way, the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father but by me was difficult when I first encountered it in my early 20s. I thought, how, how is it possible to be so exclusive? Um, how, how can we commit ourselves to something that is so, so dismissive of the relative merits of, of other ways? And yet the thing is self-evidently obvious. When he says no one can come to the Father but by me, nobody else talks about the Father. No one recognises the Father. Allah in the religion of peace is not the father he is an unknowable creative moral force and the rather incoherent book that comes from Muhammad so different from the New Testament bears none of the depth and universal significance that we find in the Gospels whoever Allah is he is a very different God from Yahweh from I am that I am, from the prodigal father as Jesus represents him. Buddha does not introduce us to the father. The Hindus don't. The secularists don't. The father only appears through Jesus. Even in Judaism, there is an extent to which he is 
almost unknowable because of his nuclear holiness and only made knowable by Jesus who comes as in a way that we can't get our heads round as as the Godhead in whom and through whom all creation hangs together and is made who then enters into what he has done and becomes part of the gift of freedom in order to accompany us it's profoundly satisfying as an answer to all our questions of why we're here and how we should manage it and what kind of god would 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 experiment with life like this giving us all the longing for him but without the means of actually getting to him because we are so flawed there's no better narrative of the human condition the one we find starting with genesis and and culminating in Jesus. Jesus for us is the best explanation of our freedom and of, and of human life. And it's he who introduces us to the Father. It's he who reminds us that there is this great sanctity of life. And when he says he is the way, the truth and the life, let's, let's look at each one of these. They're so important and so powerful. He's life, of course, because he's life after death. We're all in the middle of dying. Having begun our lives, entropy, biological entropy has hold of us, a form of gravity in time and space, pulling us down until, until we collapse into dust and ashes and biological death. And in all this, Jesus says he's the life because the spark of the Holy Spirit has given life to something inside the human heart that is independent of the entropy of the body. Some people find this to be an unacceptable kind of dualism, but to me it describes exactly who I am. My big toe, my, 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 my hulk, my body. It's, it's, it's an artifact. It, it, it is me and it's not me. Even my brain is not me. I, I exist most profoundly in a way I can't describe or see, but, but really in the, the metaphor of the heart is the most profound way. And Jesus talks, uh, the prophets have talked about the way God gives us a new heart. And Jesus talks about the need to be born again inside the artifact of the Hulk. So that our spirit, our soul, is in some form of dance, some form of love affair with him. And is brought to life by the Holy Spirit. But we have to say yes. Like a marriage, we have to consent and say, yes, I give myself to you. And when, when we have said yes to Jesus, life starts in us. And the promise of Jesus is that once that life starts in us, it will carry us through death. I remember seeing my father's corpse in hospital and being astonished at the question his corpse posed to me, which was, where has he gone? It was his face, it was his body, it was a skin that I, <laughs> I loved, and yet there was a stern and forbidding, awful emptiness. He had gone. And that seemed to me to be quite impossible. How, how could he have evaporated? And of course, this is what we mean by the soul being alive in God. And when Jesus said he is the life, what he meant was that through rising again he promised to carry our souls with him. He breaks into a new dimension and says, come with me, I'm going to take you. Behold, he says to the disciples, I'm preparing a place for you so that where I am you may be. And, and, and after having risen from the dead, we look to Jesus and we say, we're coming too. Come and get me, Lord. Come and take me with you. My soul, my heart, this part of me that dances to the music of your love, could not be separated from you or I would die from longing and again the great fear of hell is that having known love having known our purpose and having having somehow in the in the mystery of our depths gazed with eyes that are not physical into the eyes of Christ to then be parted from him with this profound longing for him that only he can satisfy that would be hell and so that's one of the reasons why as Christians we talk about the need to be forgiven because what we are being forgiven from is that thing that would come between us and the Holy God. Our moral failure, of which there is so much, because he's pure, because he's holy, 
this moral failure acts as a barrier between us and God that stops this longing finding its home. It's so important he should be the saviour and forgiver of sins. And he is. And so he is the life. He's life beyond death. And, and, and one can get quite hungry to be with him, particularly as this world becomes more and more of a fight. And the conflict between good and evil in this amphitheatre of this world sharpens and hardens. It will be good to lay down the burden and to be with him forever. All the music, all the longing, all the loving, all the poetry, all the hunger met in him. But not only is he life beyond death, but he gives us a touch of that life now. One of the reasons why some of us are on fire for love with him, because that eternal life is, is a qualitative thing, not a quantitative thing. It's begun already to be before him in prayer, to sense his presence, is to be on the foothills of heaven and to know that's where we want to be more than anywhere else. There is a quality of the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of heaven starts now and the point of praying, the point of giving ourselves to him in time and space is to allow that fire to burn more and more deeply. It's almost as if the, the more the body crumbles, as St Paul says, the more the heart and the soul are, are on fire and the fire, the fire deepens. Jesus is indeed the life. No, no other figure. No other idea, no other image produces this level of intoxicated delight that the love of Christ gives to those who know him and follow him. He is the truth. This is so important. The left, as it begins to tighten its grip on our culture and to drive Christ out of it, and we see so many puerile ways in which they try and cancel Christ from cancelling Easter eggs to uh, cancelling Christians on in the media, this cancelling hot cross buns, this, it's almost as if the demons have got a puerile sense of revenge as they try and wipe out the memory of Jesus in our culture. They cannot wipe him out of the human heart, even if they can begin to, to graffiti over memories of him in the way we live in society. But of course, one of the things we are experiencing through post-modernity and through this secular progressive, this secular progressive ideology that's beginning to asphyxiate us is an assault on the truth. So that we cannot, they, 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 we are told we cannot know truth. Nothing is true. Everything is relative. But actually, we are entitled to say we want to compare different truth claims. The whole D.I.E. diversity, inclusion and equity model is is the imposition of a false utopian equality on competence. We're entitled to say we want competence. We don't want this false manipulation of victimhood to give social credit to one group rather than another. We don't believe it when the post-modernists post tell us there is no there is no truth to be known, only a series of multiple narratives that take their authenticity from the angle of the person beholding or speaking or thinking. Some things bear the weight of our inquiry, the weight of our trust, and others don't. Then, of course, they exist on a graduated scale. But the most true way of understanding the world is through the lips of Jesus, when he tells us that we were born for a purpose, that we're involved in a fight between life and death, between good and evil, between light and darkness. And he's come to help us through with the help of the angels and above all with his sacrifice on the cross that will lift the burden of our flawed natures from our shoulders. The truth about human beings is that they are sacred and they're made in the image of God. The truth about human beings is we've been given the opportunity through the exercise of freedom of choice to choose eternal life or eternal rebellion. The truth about human beings is that we're caught swinging between 
annihilation, non-existence before birth and non-existence after birth. And for a moment, we have this consciousness that is profoundly moral and spiritual, which God speaks to. And then he confronts us in Jesus and we say, I know you. I know who you are. You are the living God. Like Thomas kneeling at his, at his feet after the resurrection. Thomas recognises Christ as my Lord and my God, as do we. Jesus is the truth. By using the words of Jesus as we find him in the Gospels and applying to life around us, we can tell the difference between those who are true and those who are false, between those who are intoxicated with power and those who are intoxicated with love. We can tell the difference between those who offer the, offer the, 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 the balm of forgiveness against those who drink the poison of revenge. And one of the great divides of so many divides between human beings is those who are willing to offer the healing of forgiveness because they have been forgiven. The whole point of being a Catholic and having the access to confession and knowing you're forgiven and then offering that forgiveness to others who have wounded you sometimes beyond imagination and bearing is that we become conduits of the living life and truth of Christ. He is the truth. Everything he said was true. And by that truth, we understand ourselves and the world we live in. But we have to make a journey. Here's the odos. Here's the way. How do we journey through this life? But metaphorically, spiritually, with him, to follow him. He invites those who recognise him to deny themselves, be willing to sacrifice what we, what our other appetites long for and to follow him. He is the way. Early Christians called themselves followers of the way. We're not rooted in, in time. We are journeying through time. Every day is a journey. Every hour is a journey. We are a pilgrim people. We're on the move all the time. Uh, a bit like boats sailing through the water. Every every moment we need to trim our sails and trim our route. Every day we find ourselves with, with choices about how we spend the time, what we think about, what we long for, what moral actions we take. And each point, every little crossroads, we say, which is the way of Jesus? And as we follow him in his way, we make our way through this complexity of time and space and moral choices. It is done through trust and often we go wrong and then he always comes and puts us right. Looking back in my life, <laughs> I began to see some of the times when I simply went wrong. I made the most silly choices and it would be very easy to become bitter and, and to despair and to say, well, I, I, I messed up so much, <laughs> so many better, better ways I could have managed this. And yet I'm so clear now that every time I messed up, at the next crossroads I encountered Jesus, who, as it were, said, let's take this route. And by the next choice, took me back towards where he wanted me to be. So my life has been a series of snakes and ladders. And every time I've gone down a snake, Jesus has appeared with a ladder and said, let's take you to where I want you to be. And then down another snake. And then the Lord comes with a ladder. Let me take you nearer where I want you to be. Always with endless love and endless patience. And most importantly, with this extraordinary capacity, which is the kingdom of heaven, to bring good out of bad. Every tragedy, every serious mistake, every moral failure, every falling flat on one's face, every, every glue patch of despair God comes to. And when it's handed over to him, he uses it as a fresh way to place a ladder in our lives and carry us up the ladder to the place closer to where he wants us to be. Nothing is wasted. No experience of suffering, of misery, of disillusion, of despair, of, of brokenness. Nothing is wasted in God's economy. He takes everything and out of it builds this ladder up which he carries us closer to where he wants us to be. Jesus, 
the life of the resurrection, the way, the truth and the life, bringing us close, bringing us to the Father as nobody else could or would. As we face these two alternatives, these two power, these movements of power and compulsion from the right and from the left, one of the good things that comes of this is that it is a stripping down of the church to the bare essentials. He's inviting us to, to discover, to learn in ourselves what truly matters most. He's pruning us. Those whom I love, I prune, he says. Those who do not respond become like dead wood and he breaks them off. So the moment we're being pruned as a church, it's not up for us to, to us to decide how history is going to end or continue. All he asks is for us to be faithful in this generation. And so to be faithful now is to tell the truth about Jesus to a world that wants to silence him. To act the truth about Jesus to a world that wants to make human beings in a completely different shape. But what we have on our side is that God has made every human being ravenously hungry for him. Only he can satisfy the human heart. And as we look at the people around us, pushing the religion of peace with its terrifying lust for power, control and threats of death for apostates. And as we look at cultural Marxism with again its terrifying lust for power and compulsion, twisting human beings out of their God-given individual shape and thrusting them into collective groups of, of like, we have the message, the person, the power of the Holy Spirit, the dunamis, the dynamite, to set them free. And by being faithful to Jesus, we unlock the doors by which Satan has imprisoned them behind these false ideologies. Jesus will come again. Jesus will raise us from the death. The victory belongs to Jesus. What he asks of us is to be faithful, to be alert, to be alive, to tell the truth, to live the truth, to pray the truth. We have courage and conviction because Christ is risen. He is with us. He is in us. And he sends his angels and gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit we have everything we need. He just asks us to keep being faithful. He who endures to the end shall be saved. This is a marathon, an endurance race. And as the darkness closes in on our dying culture, we will continue to light the candle of faith. We will continue to be faithful to Jesus, who is the light of the world. And pray for our neighbours, our competitors, our opponents, the haters, that they too may come into the light of God and this wonderful inheritance that he invented, invested for them from the beginning of time. So we may hear him say, come into the kingdom, my beloved of the Father, prepared for you from the beginning of time. To him be the glory forever and ever. May he protect his church. May he give courage to those of us who love him and serve him. And may he bring us out of the trials that lie before us and give us the victory over all that is dark and dangerous and distorted. To Christ be glory for ever and ever. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. <laughs>